Hi, everyone. It's 4 o'clock in New York. If he wanted to end the Russia investigation, this was a diabolical way to do it. The self-proclaimed law and order president has effectively brought the wheels of justice to a grinding halt with his self-created, self-perpetrated government shutdown. The FBI Agents Association announcing in a 72-page report today that, quote, the shutdown has eliminated any ability to operate. That's according to one agent, and that, quote, the U.S. Attorney's Office is unable to issue grand jury subpoenas for financial institutions. That's according to another, the shutdown having real-world consequences. While the president, possibly living in a parallel universe, declares by fiat that he's delivering the State of the, the Union address next Tuesday in Congress, or perhaps at another venue. A senior administration official telling NBC News that White House speechwriters are hard at work on separate passages that could lend themselves to a speech at a different venue and for a different audience than members of Congress. But we start, we start with that report from the FBI agents. Donald Trump has the entire federal government shut down over border security. But it turns out his shutdown may be the graver threat to our security. The report details the damage being done to the nation's premier law enforcement agency as the shutdown enters its second month. One agent writes, quote, I have been working a long-term MS-13 investigation for over three years. Since the shutdown, I have not had a Spanish speaker in the division. We have several Spanish-speaking informants. We are only able to communicate using a three-way call with a linguist in another division. Another agent writes, quote, not being able to pay confidential human sources risks losing them and the information they provide forever. It is not a switch we can turn on and off. And another, quote, on the child exploitation side, as an undercover employee, I've had to put pervs on standby. This just puts children in jeopardy. And finally, put simply, quote, the fear is our enemies know they can run freely. Joining us from the New York Times, Chief White House Correspondent Peter Baker, former FBI Assistant Director for Counterintelligence, Frank Figluzzi, Jeremy Bash, former Chief of Staff at the CIA and the Pentagon, and at the table, Elise Jordan, former aide in the George W. Bush White House and State Department, now the co-host of the podcast Words Matter, and Eugene Robinson, columnist and associate editor for The Washington Post. I have to start with you, Frank Figluzzi. I read this report with my eyes rolling back in my head and my stomach sinking. The, 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 take us through all of the work. I talked to a former senior law enforcement official who said, forget about drug cases. They're done. You can't prosecute them or investigate them without money. And on the counter intel side, I assume a lot of informants um, rely on the financial piece of that partnership. You know, Nicole, I'll never forget as a very young supervisor at headquarters getting called up to the assistant director's office. And I it was a very sensitive closed door meeting about a case. I turn around to walk out and I see a sign posted on the back of his office door and I'll never forget it. It said, America is at peace because the FBI is at war. And that was the mentality then and it's the mentality now. The American people need to understand the FBI goes to battle on our streets every single day. If you think this means nothing to you, understand that the gang that's preventing you from sending your kids to the local playground because it's too dangerous. The guy selling crack at the end of the street that makes you feel unsafe to go by. None of that's getting done on the FBI side. Sexual predators, crimes against children, kidnapping. And let's talk about the global impact in terms of counterterrorism. All of this being curtailed. It's the FBI's job to counter the greatest threats facing America. But now, What's possible is the greatest threat of all is coming from the Oval Office and, and our president. It's an insider threat. There's real impact to this. If you're, if you're not buying into this concept of, hey, no federal employee needs, uh, needs to treat their job as an entitlement, I don't care if people aren't putting food on their table, let's go with that, put that aside, and let's look at the impact on you and your neighborhood and your town, village, and city and understand that this is already being felt on the streets of your neighborhood. Jeremy, I don't think we can underscore enough that the biggest section in this FBI report, and I suggest everybody take a look at it. I would love to know if the White House looked at it. I'd love to know if the president 
read this report and read these words directly from the FBI agents, I'd like to know if the law and order president understands just how badly he's weakened the nation's top cops. But I'd like you to explain how counter intel works in terms of this relationship that we have with informants. They're not necessarily um, good guys as depicted in movies. Sometimes they're making a tough choice, right, between helping the United States of America and, and perhaps working against the United States of America. That relationship depends on continuity. We need to be reliable partners and we need to be able to pay for their services. Is that right? That's right. And each and every day, the counterintelligence professionals at CIA and at the Department of Defense work hand in hand with their colleagues at the FBI and they rely on the FBI so when you pull out the capability of the FBI from the national security apparatus you're not just hurting the Federal Bureau of Investigation you're not just hurting those specific cases you're also hurting all of the activity that the CIA the Defense Department and other agencies rely upon from their colleagues in federal law enforcement and just to put a fine point on it if you are running a case in counterintelligence or counterespionage or even in the context of a drug case and your responsibility is to show up, run a human source or participate as an undercover asset and actually make a purchase, make a buy, funnel money to a, a, a potential target of an investigation and you don't show up with that money because the federal government's shut down and there's no appropriation, you're suspect. And you're suspect, the fact that you're suspect means that, that, that in some ways uh, the target of the investigation may realize that an un undercover investigation is underway. What? You just forgot to pay the money the same day that the federal government shut down? It's too obvious. It's too overt. It's very bad tradecraft, and it's very endangering to our own assets. And Frank Figluzzi, this is something that all Americans can understand. The agents who contributed to this report came from field offices all over the country. Um, they wrote about something as simple as not being able to pay for an informant's phone card. The idea that we would burn a source, burn a line of information on the counter intel side or the counter terror side over a phone card that we can no longer pay for seems to be a stain on American credibility. Would you, would you agree with that assessment and would you put the blame squarely on the president? So first, not only our allies are looking at this saying what gives with this and I'm sure they're feeling for our intelligence community but I'm even far more concerned about our adversaries looking at this. There are champagne corks being popped back in the Kremlin right now because they couldn't have engineered a better scenario. FBI that can't pay its bills, can't pay informants. And, and yes, it's, the, the leadership is responsible for this. The leader responsible for this is the guy who said he owns this and he'll take, he'll take it on the chin for the shutdown, and that's Donald Trump. So that's a reflection of the degree to which our president is putting self-interest over national interest. The thing that worries me the most, if I had to point to one thing um, the, in terms of impact, Nicole, linguists. Linguists who sit and translate sensitive wiretaps, eavesdropping, in counterterrorism cases. What is not being listened to today? What is being put on the shelf today that will have to be listened to after the government reopens, what are we missing in terms of a secret code or a plan being discussed to hit some city in the United States? That's my number one concern. Jeremy Bash, I spoke to a former senior national security official today who said that his concern for all of Donald Trump's um, chaos creation, for all of his misguided pronouncements, for all the suspicions around all the conduct and secrecy around his contacts and communications with Russia and Russians, nothing really, there, there hasn't been a 9-11, there hasn't been a terrorist attack on his watch, and that the real fear in the national security establishment is what happens then. Are you, would you guess that the national security folks who are still inside the Pentagon and inside the CIA and, and, and perhaps even inside the National Security Council are watching this president um, who, who, who seems to not be sweating. He, he's sweating his poll numbers. He's sweating his wall. He doesn't seem to be sweating the impact that the shutdown has on the FBI or on the CIA or on the kind of operations you and Frank are talking about. What do you think they're experiencing on day 32? Well, no, first of all, it's worse than that because this entire shutdown 
has been conducted in the name, supposedly, of national security. Remember the national security crisis at the border that the president presented to the American people? And in fact, as most national security professionals have now come forward and made clear, the real national security crisis is the fact that the FBI isn't getting paid, that the fact that the TSA isn't getting paid, that aviation security is being compromised, that professionals of the Department of Homeland Security, the Coast Guard are being asked to engage in garage sales to pay their mortgage, to pay their rent. That is the true national security emergency. And just to your point about whether or not the president could re handle a real crisis, one of the historians on this network was pointing out yesterday a point I think really is, is worth emphasizing, which is that even in the dark days of the Nixon uh, era, when he was as beleaguered as they come and he was facing a certain impeachment, that fall in October 1973, when, when Watergate was heating up, there was a crisis in the Middle East. Israel was invaded mm -hmm. by Arab nations surrounding it, and the United States had to come to Israel's assistance. I shudder to think if there were a true national security crisis that would present itself to the Oval Office, to the National Security Council at this moment. Peter Baker, the White House's attention today not on any of these issues, not as far as we know on this FBI report, not on the kinds of things Jeremy Orfink are talking about, but on the details and the logistics and the walkthrough and the theatrics and the script for the State of the Union. Well, yes, and, and that may be paving the way for at least a temporary ceasefire in the shutdown. Just before uh, the show went on the air, the Senate leaders, uh, Chuck Schumer and Mitch McConnell, announced that they have a plan to put two bills on the floor, the first of which will be the president's bill, which Democrats have already declared dead on arrival, the one that would fund his wall with only temporary uh, protections for some of these younger immigrants. And then they're going to put on, on the floor a bill that would put, push off uh, this debate until February 8th and reopen the government in the meantime. That looks like it could actually uh, pass. And if that's the case, then we could see a sort of uh, at least a temporary lull so the president could, in fact, come to the uh, Hill next week, give his State of the Union address, and negotiators might have time to sit down and, uh, and, and talk through this border wall without the kind of impact that you've been focusing on uh, rightly in this, in this uh, segment. Peter, what are you hearing is motivating the White House? It's my understanding that it's his poll numbers and the fact that he's being blamed that are, that are sort of getting, getting under his skin a lot more than the human calamity of the shutdown. Well, one of the things that's really interesting about this shutdown, of course, it's not a complete government shutdown as we've had at times in the past. Because it's a partial shutdown, about a quarter of the government, we haven't seen as early as we have in the past some of the impacts that you're describing and that this report talks about. So for a lot of Americans, uh, the government shutdown was an abstraction at first, and only as each day goes by, you see more and more of the consequences of it. And I think that's something the president hasn't focused on, really. You haven't heard him talk about it. He hasn't really expressed the kind of empathy that people would like him uh, to express both for the workers who are not being paid, 800,000 of them, and for the people, uh, the American people whose services aren't being provided, either because of uh, FBI, you know, restricting their ability to take action or other agencies that aren't able to uh, fulfill their duties. Eugene, you write today in an amazing piece, um, Trump made federal workers and other citizens who depend on government services into sacrificial lambs whose blood is an offering to the Trumpist base. Negotiations about a solution are at a standstill because Trump's self-proclaimed negotiation prowess comes down to taunts and tweets. The next time you take a flight, hope that the agents who inspected passengers' luggage and the traffic controllers who guide pilots through the sky are thinking about their work, not worrying about how to make ends meet. Yeah, it's the, it, the column really is about gratuitous cruelty. And that's a theme that has run through this administration from day one to today, right? It's, it's, he goes out of his way to be, to be cruel to people, the, the family separations, the way he, um, he, he dismantled the, uh, or tried to dismantle the Affordable Care Act simply because it was named after President Obama, with no, absolutely no consideration, not a, no thought as to what it was doing to people, uh, to individual innocent people who were caught in the sort of um, crossfire. And he just doesn't care about that. As we've talked about before, the president doesn't have the empathy gene. He just doesn't do empathy. And so when he hears what Frank and Jeremy were saying, which was harrowing about uh, the, the, the FBI and its, its constricted ability to do its job, um, I can imagine President Trump sitting there and saying, 
good, that'll show him because the FBI is bad. Remember, the FBI mm -hmm. opened investigations of him mm -hmm. and how, you know, they can't do that to him. He'll show them. So he's probably saying that's a good thing rather than, and it's, I mean, it's shocking, but that's where we are. Um, he doesn't have an empathy, empathy gene, but, but the vast majority of Americans do. And I wonder, Elise, what, what, what you think it, the impact is of, of interviews like this. Putting cancer in your budget is, um, it's unexpected, but we just have to deal with it. So this is where we are right now. And um, with no end in sight, this is like the most horrible experience ever. Oh, yeah. Can't negotiate with my chemo. That has to happen. So if it's chemo or the rent, chemo wins. So Donald Trump's legacy, baby cages, and chemo or rent. Diabetics who can't afford their insulin shots. This is the Donald Trump lack of empathy we see every day. And on day 32, I think it's important to remember what Donald Trump said back in December when he met with Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer. He said, I will shut down the government. I am proud to shut down the government. He said he was going to own the shutdown. And he, that's starting to show up in polling. And he does own the shutdown. And he should, because you can see that this is an exercise in ego, much more than a president concerned with national security because he's fighting for a border wall. Instead, we're sacrificing investigations against MS-13, which he has claimed is a huge threat because of his own ego. But if Mitch McConnell is now, as Peter Baker said, ready to bring to the floor a, a bill that puts it all off to February 8th, not that that's a long time away, right? That's like a couple of weeks. But if uh, if, if he's ready to do that, that tells me that, that McConnell's view of the situation has shifted now. And, and he's probably hearing from Republican senators who are saying, look, this thing has got to end. Right. Um, <clears throat> because they used to watch the news and have a conscience. Unclear if they still do. Frank Zaglisi, I want to ask you a question. I'm not a conspiracy theorist yet, but I wonder if you think that shutting down the government and having the FBI's investigations and prosecutions and the ability to get um, anything in front of a grand jury and the, 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 the ability to function, if you think it isn't just a sad casualty, but, but maybe something that Donald Trump isn't really bothered by. Gosh, I, I, you know, if it weren't for this president, I'd say, yeah, let's let's not engage in conspiracy theories. But nothing surprises me anymore, Nicole. And, and there's been much discussion about even a larger potential agenda, which is that he wants the government to shut down, that he wants to come in and save the day and take control as only a dictator type leader could take control. And so he's never liked all of this bureaucracy. He's never liked the agencies and institutions of government. So he's at a minimum, he's not feeling any sense of loss here, but at a maximum on its worst case conspiracy theorist scenario, he might literally be trying to um, create a situation where only he can swoop in, save the day, pick and choose the agencies he wants to be funded or not and declare some type of national emergency. We're facing a national emergency, but the emergency is in the Oval Office. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.